What's up, guys? Hokage Puya here. The Premier League is back this week. You guys, let's just get Al Elfin out of the room. I haven't posted in a week. I was I was at a wedding. Duty called. Wedding duties called. My first ever time at a wedding. It was fantastic. I enjoyed myself. I'm back making this video today. The Premier League starts this week. Match day one on Friday. And you guys, everyone's favorite kinds of videos. Prediction videos. I'm going to predict the Premier League table for you guys. 1 through 20. And we're going to see in May 2025 if I'm an idiot or if I'm a genius. So without further ado, let me pull up my screen. And 20th place right away. Let's just get into it. 20th place, Ipswich Town. Now, I understand Kieran McKenna, this young manager. I think he's like 38 years old, whatever it is. I think for strengthening into the Premier League, they bought in too many young players. I'm pretty sure the bulk of their signings were under 24, under 23 years old. You're a promoted team. You're a team with very limited Premier League experience in Ipswich Town, and you're going to rely upon the backs of under 24, under 23 players that I don't even rate too highly. It's disaster waiting to happen. They're going to have fun this season. The Ipswich Town fans, 20 whatever Premier League, uh, what is it, 19, 18 Premier League home games. Enjoy yourselves while it lasts, Ipswich fans, because you guys haven't strengthened in the right ways. And I understand Ipswich doesn't have the money to go out there and get the best players and the best, best young players to reinforce their squad. So maybe I'll be an idiot. And maybe this is where Kieran McKenna, if he's the manager and the young, bright manager everyone thinks he is, this is where Kieran McKenna could get Ipswich away from the relegation zone and get back-to-back -back seasons of Premier League football. I don't think it'll happen. Not too high on Kieran McKenna. He can prove me wrong big time with this prediction, but 20th place for Ipswich Town. I'm sorry, guys. You're going back down to the trenches of the championship. 19th place, Southampton. It's, it's a similar thing with Southampton. Haven't really strengthened, in my opinion, enough with the right players. And I think Southampton... You know, I, I think, what was it? With with Ralph Hasenutl, the, the, the times they were getting smashed by seven goals in the Premier League before they dropped into the, the championship. So I don't see that changing. I don't think the defense is strong enough. I think something I'd like to see in promoted teams is that they can sit back and play defensive football and make it hard for teams. But I don't think Southampton have that quality. And for that, I think they're going to get relegated, relegated 19th place back into the trenches with Ipswich Town into the drudges of the disgusting, ugly football that is the championship. Southampton FC, I'll see you guys in the championship in a year's time. Uh, yeah, sorry, guys. 18th place. Now, 18th place, Forest. Now, I understand this is Nuno Espirito Santos. This is, you know, he's had a, he's going to get his full season now. He's at a full summer with this Knott's Forest team. And they've sold some key players. But Forrest has, basically, if I'm going to su uh, summarize Forrest's uh, summer window, they replaced what they sold. So I feel like that they'd somewhat like to like replacements with what they sold. You know, guys like Gordos didn't get contract renewals. Ivan Tony's still here. The, th the thing that interests me, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking about Brentford. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My mind went to Brentford. Forrest doesn't have Brentford. Callum Adedoy and all those dudes. Uh, Morgan Gibbs why Chris Wood. I know a lot of people are hot on Chris Wood. He had an underrated season last year in the Premier League, but I just don't think Forrest has the squad to survive another year in the Premier League. I really don't think they do. Yes, Callum Hunter, yes, Chris Wood, Morgan Gibbs why whatever. I understand, but I just have a feeling that it's not enough. It's not enough for Forrest, and I think they will get relegated. What is it for two, one or two seasons, three seasons in the Premier League? I don't even know how many seasons they've been here now, but Forrest, I think they're going to go down a year's time. They'll be playing championship football. No, you know, I know Nuno's an experienced guy. Wolves had his, the failure stint uh, at Spurs, trying to redeem himself here at Forrest. I just don't think he has the tools to do so. With the signings they made with everyone that left, I just don't think the tools are there for Nuno to really get his team playing the way he wants him to. I think this will be the year. Forest gets relegated, unfortunately. Anyways, 17th. Who do I have in the 17th place? Barely surviving relegation this coming season in the Premier League. I have Fulham. Now, my main reason with Fulham being so low. So think about this. Tim Ream, two key players gone that I don't think they really replaced fully. So coming out of this team is Palinia. 
and Tim Ream. And Tim Ream, their veteran center back that has been there many, many years, got, you know, getting them back to the Premier League, being a Premier League mainstay center back for Fulham. He's gone. He went back to the MLS, came back to here in America to retire for, I think he went to Charlotte. And the big one for me, I think, you know, Tim Ream is expendable, although he's a, a leader in the team in the dressing room. Palina is the guy that I think, you know, is going to be missed because the amount of dirty work Palina would do in the midfield for Fulham hasn't been replaced. I think it's Mbabu, the, the Bundesliga experience right back. That's a great signing. Don't get me wrong. Mbabu is tons and tons of game in the, games in the Bundesliga for Wolfsburg, for Augsburg. That's an experienced player, Swiss international, former Swiss international. Ryan Sessegnon, he's coming in on loan, I believe, from Spurs and Emil Smith Rowe, a uh, permanent transfer from Arsenal. If Emil Smith Rowe can be fit for once in his career, it's been a couple years now, he could be impactful for Fulham, impactful for Fulham in the attack. But I'm sorry, two important players like Reem and, and, and Jao Palina not being replaced. It doesn't bode. I don't think it's gonna. It, it's gonna go well, and I think Marco Silva is gonna miss those players big time. They finished thirteenth last season. I think this season with two key players being replaced with no one, they will struggle, um, especially in the midfield, especially trying to play defensive and countering. I think they'll get seventeenth place, um, but we'll see. Seventeenth place, Fulham. Sixteenth place. Now, sixteenth place. I do have. I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. 16th place, I'm a Google Slides merchant, and I just messed up the Google Slides, so maybe I'm not a Google Slides merchant. I'm an idiot. I'm a donkey. Anyway, Leicester City, the only uh, promoted team, I think, will that will survive this season in, in the Premier League. Now, I, you know, if I'm to give you a pretty good reason as to why they will stay up, I can't. The reason I think Leicester, coming back to the Premier League, they will, you know, survive a season, maybe one season max and go back down unless they get a you know money pumped to the team and strengthened. Because really, Leicester City hasn't really strengthened to the level that I would want from a promoted team, right? But they have a new manager, and that, that, that's where my biggest issue is. They were, uh, they were great in the championship last season. Um, they still have a guy like Jamie Vardy there, but Jamie Vardy is a bench player. You know, he's not an out and out starter anymore for this team, you know, but the big question mark for Leicester city is Maresca left and Maresca was the manager who imposed this, you know, more control on the midfield for Leicester. And that got you promoted to the premier league. Maresca is now at Chelsea. So with the new manager, Steve Cooper, Leicester is a little bit of a question mark for me. Um, but one of the main reasons I think they will survive is because I think Leicester coming back to the Premier League, being former Premier League champs, I really think at home, these guys can be a threat. Um, and that's where they can pick up most of their points. Um, so Leicester, I think, you know, and another reason for that is, you know, I think Fulham and Forrest, I think are genuinely same level of squad as Leicester. And I think, you know, with these, with especially like a Fulham losing two key players like Polina and, and Tim Ream, I think that's where Leicester City can trump them for 16th place. But, you know, when we're talking about 16, 17, 18, you know, in the Premier League, oh, there's, um, you know, Google Slides Genius right here just leaked my 15th place. But the, the difference between these places can be one, two, three points. So Leicester, 16th place um, for the Foxes. Um, and, yes, I leaked it, number 15, uh, Wolves. Now, Wolves with Gary O'Neill got 14th uh, last season. I think, you know, Kilman was sold. I just don't know about Wolves. I, I feel like their squad definitely hasn't gotten stronger. Um, I know there's guys, I think Podence is back and, and all those guys, but I don't think Wolves' team got necessarily stronger during this window. And I wasn't convinced with them last season, 14th place. I, as long as they're surviving, I think Wolves is always going to be happy. Um, you know, gone are the days with Nuno where they got into Europe. I think it was a couple of seasons ago. Maybe I think it was during COVID or pre COVID. Um, those days aren't here for Wolves anymore. And I think staying in the Premier League is the objective every season. 15th place with a team that hasn't really been bolstered this window. I think 15th place is a very good shot for Wolves. And again, you know, the, the points difference between these teams is coming out of one, two, three points. You know what I mean? That's how the, that's how every league is, especially the Premier League. So 15th place for Wolves. Sorry, boys. Um, you suck, basically. You're mid. <laughs> mid team in Wolves, 15th place. 14th, 14th, 14th now. 14th place. Again, I, I don't know how to work my thing. I think Brentford are going to have a worse season off than last time. Um, th now this is where, when I was, my mind was on Brentford with Thomas Frank. Now Brentford 
their only notable signing is Igor Thiago from Club Brugge, from from the, the the Belgian team, right? And my issue with that is, I think Igor Thiago is actually injured right now, so he won't even be there at the start of the season. Now that is a striking option, right? The thing I like about Brentford is that attack. You have Ivan Tony now. Ivan Tony coming back from his ban from gambling. He wasn't the best in that second half of the season for Brentford, but I think this season with a preseason under his belt, he's definitely staying at the club, it looks like. Um, I don't see anyone snapping him up, Arsenal or anything. I think he's staying at the club. Brentford's attack looks very dangerous. You have Mbuma on the right. You have Tony at striker. You have Fisa at left wing. You have a guy like Kevin Schade also. I really like Kevin Schade, 21, 22-year-old German Kevin Schade coming off the bench, potentially starting some games if Mbuma gets injured again long-term, even playing off the left maybe. There's a dangerous attack there. And, you know, t- guys, a guy like Raya obviously was always going to commit to Arsenal long term. Godos, uh, 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 he's wasn't a key midfielder starting, but Godos, the, my, my fellow Persian brother, he was good off the bench. He was a reliable bench midfielder for Godos. They didn't really replace him. Um, and Malpai still on loan to Everton. So that's not really a miss. The attack is so strong. My issues with Brentford are in the midfield and in defense. Um, and I don't think they've recruited well there. And I think they're going to have a worse season. Um, no, sorry. I'm sorry. I think they're going to have a better season this time around with Thomas Frank, with another preseason, with Ivan Tony here the entire season from match day one to match day 38. I don't know why I was saying the whole time they're having a worse season. Last season, Brentford actually finished 16th. Brentford this time, I think I'm going to finish 14th. I think Visa and Bumu and, and, and Tony are really going to carry this team because I don't think the strength is there in defense and in midfield. So Brentford, 14th place. Now, Bournemouth, 13th place. Now, I was originally, if you asked me a week ago, I would have put Bournemouth maybe sneaking into the top 10, into the top half of the table, 10th place, a cheeky 10th place. I was thinking about that for Bournemouth. Um, but Iriola, see... I don't know why Solanke was just offloaded like that because it seemed like out of, I didn't know, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think Tottenham was linked to Solanke all summer. The deal just happened. One morning I wake up, I think it was the day I was going to Dallas for the wedding I was going to. Solanke confirmed in the morning off to Spurs. And I'm thinking, well, that's a great signing. So I'll talk about that in the Spurs portion where, where you see where I place him in the, in, in the league table. But I think the loss of Solanke's goals I think they're going to have a slightly worse season now. Well, they got 12th this season. If they got 13th, that's basically the same thing. Um, but I do think with the teams above them that I have that have strengthened more, I think Bournemouth getting 13th place would be a successful season for them. Um, they have brought in players, Sintetera from Leeds, um, Unal from Guendafe, um, a really young uh, Spanish uh, Dutch center back. He hasn't committed yet. Uh, Houston from Juventus. So, yeah, the big miss here, Solanke, his goals. He would get goals in big games, too. I remember the goals against Manchester United. So Solanke, gone, means less goals, in my opinion, for Bournemouth. Lack of a clinical striker. I think they'll re- relatively finish around the same way, uh, 13th place for Bournemouth in this coming season. Now, 12th place, Everton. So let's just get it straight with Everton, guys. Don't expect anything from Everton style-wise, football-wise. This is going to be peak Sean Dyche football back at it again reminiscent of Burnley five years ago, go reminiscent of those peak Daesh days, park the bus in the back, get it done. They have the players to do so. The defense, Tarkovsky, I think Tarkovsky is there now. You have Mikolenko. You have all those guys. Michael Keane is still there. Michael Keane is the most stereotypical Sean Daesh center back I could think of. He looks the part. He plays the part. Everton, with you know, Everton has lost players. Now they've brought in Jake O'Brien from Lyon. I heard he's decent. Uh, Indaye from Marseille, I heard he's decent. One I like, Lindstrom. Now, people, if you don't know who Lindstrom is, Lindstrom um, played for Eintracht Freifer in the Bundesliga a couple years. People were calling him the Muller region because he celebrates like Thomas Muller. But Lindstrom is a cheeky little signing. I like, you know, attacking midfielder can, you know, spark some magic in that Everton attack whenever they are attacking, if they are attacking. But, you know, with Godfrey, Godfrey left, the big miss for Everton this season is going to be in midfield with Onana. We'll see how Sean Dyche, um survives uh, without Onana in there. Onana was, without a doubt, the best player on this Everton team, the most technically sound player. Midfield, you know, amazing in midfield. They don't have it anymore this season, but Sean Dyche, Everton, 
when I think of Everton and Sean Dyche, I think of a perfect match of park the bus football. And I think it's going to be successful for them. I think they could get 12th place. I think their defense is definitely their strongest phase of the field, Everton. And I think that playing to their favorite, obviously they have Jordan Pickford. I think one of the best goalies in the Premier League, um, shot stopping wise, maybe not too much playing out of the back, but Everton, they don't play that style. You know what I mean? Sean Dyche doesn't care. Just hoof the ball up and reset. That's Everton for you. 12th place. Brighton, 11th. Now, Brighton is interesting because their manager, very, very young. St. Pauli's manager from last year, um, Fabian Hüsler. God, I can't say his name. Fabian Hüsler. Hüsler. Yeah, I, you know, I support Germany. I was born in Germany. I can't even say his last name. I mean, yeah, I'm a fraud. 11th place for uh, Brighton this season. Now, Brighton's squad is still pretty strong. It's just, I don't know what, I don't know what, let's call him Fabian. I don't know what Fabian is going to do. I, 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 I don't know. Brighton, they did bring in Minte from Newcastle, who's a, a, apparently a bright and up and coming star with, within the Newcastle ranks. They bought him, they took him off his hand. The big signing I like for Feyenoord, Matt Weifer from Feyenoord. Matt Weiford, Weiford. Matt Weifer is a midfield destroyer, you guys. And that is key because who has Brian lost? Well, Undov committed to Stuttgart. We know after the amazing season he had last season under Uli Honus and Stuttgart in the Bundesliga, he was always going to commit there. But the big loss, Pascal Gross. Pascal Gross to Dortmund, uh, 33-year-old veteran midfielder for Brighton. C crucial in the attack, penalty kick taker. They need someone to come fill the void in midfield. Now, Matt Weifer is a midfield destroyer. He is going to win you the ball back. He is a ball-winning midfielder, defense-first midfielder, Matt Weifer from Feyenoord. So it's not the same profile of Pascal Gross, but that tells me what Fabian Hörsler is thinking. He is. I don't expect from Brian really attacking football this season. You know, not at least not to the level of De Zerbi. They're still going to attack. You know, he's. You know, Fabian is one of these. I'm probably guessing one of these hipster German managers coming out uh, of Germany right now. Let's see if he's good enough for the Premier League. Let's see if he could crack it, you know. Let's see if he's ready for the big time. But with Matt Weaver coming in, he's going to be a starter for Brighton. They still have quality in attack. Mitoma, Welbeck, all those guys, right? Lewis Dunk in the back, uh, Verbruggen in, in goal. The quality is still there for Brighton. I think Estupinian and, and all those guys, Tariq Lamptey. The, the, the squad is still Premier League quality. I'm just, Fabian is a very, uh, he's an unknown for me. And I think Brighton, their squad is definitely stronger in my uh, in comparison to all the other teams I've already listed in the league table. And I think Brighton, due to other teams being stronger than, than them and the manager being quite a, little, a bit of an outlier, I think 11th place Brighton, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they end up 9, 10, 11th place. But I'm going to go 11th because who would I have in 10th? I have 10th in West Ham now. Initially, I wanted to put West Ham higher because I really think out of the Premier League teams, I think West Ham has had the best transfer window, if not one of the best, at least. You know, West Ham, they offloaded some of the dead weights. Tilo Kerr came back from loan. They gave him the Monaco, 17 million, whatever. Saeed Ben Rama, they sent him, they sent him over, you know, to Ligo and got, got the official price tag for him. I think it was 28 million or something. Calvin Phillips, that dead weight from Man City, they got rid of him. Remember last season they brought in Edson Alvarez. I thought that was a good signing. Didn't really quite gel for them, in my opinion, last season. You know, injuries or whatever it was for West Ham. I didn't think they played as well as they should have. But this season, the signing guys, the signings, Max Kilman from Wolves. Boom, slot him in the back there. Starting center back from Moyes. Todibo from Nice. Todibo from Nice and Ligue 1, he's been having a couple of good seasons there in France. On loan from, from Nice, great signing in defense. So West Ham already strengthening their defense a lot. And, you know, Antonio, decent player for West Ham, has been a good servant. He's just not the clinical goal scorer that West Ham needs. So what do West Ham do? They go on and get my boy, Luke, Niklas Fulkrug. They signed Niklas Fulkrug from Dortmund. I, I forget the price tag, but Niklas Fulkrug is going to be that fox in the box. He is actually very good in the build-up play as well. I think Niklas Fulkrug can have a very good season for West Ham here under David Moyes. And I think, you know, initially I wanted to put West Ham, you know, uh, in the eighth, seventh, surprising, surprise placement for West Ham. But I just think there's teams stronger than them that will perform more consistently than them over the 30 game season. But I think West Ham getting 10th would be a successful season. Really be on the lookout, man, for, for, for Niklas Fuku. Niklas Fuku, 
Kudus, all those guys in the back, Todibo, Max Kilman, all of a sudden, West Ham looked good. And with Moyes at the helm, I think he was a very good manager. They could outperform 10th easily. But I have him at 10th right now. So let's see. Ninth. Now, let me explain. Let me explain. Newcastle, where's the business? Where's the business for Newcastle? No one no there's no one notable that came in for Newcastle. And I like Eddie Howe. I think Eddie Howe is actually the best English manager. He I think his understanding of football and how it should be played, you know, setting up attacking systems, high press. He understands it right now. He's ahead of all the English managers. You could probably could grant put Graham Potter up up there with him, but Potter doesn't even have a job. Eddie Howe does. And for a reason. The last season, Newcastle got seventh. Um, and remember the season before they got in the Champions League, blah, 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 blah. They beat PSG, but they ended up getting grouped in the group stage. Um, and they've got rid of Lewis Hall. Um, I think he went to Chelsea, I believe. And uh, wait, where did Lewis Hall go? Did Lewis Hall go to Chelsea? No, no, no. The Lewis Hall was there and they signed Lewis Hall permanently from Chelsea. My bad. And they got rid of Mintes. So Newcastle doesn't have any notable, you know, buys, but no notable sells. And it's the same squad. In fact, I would, you know, I would even say a signing is Tonali. Now, Tonali was a signing from last summer, but the guy got a, you know, a season long ban one month into the season. So Tonali is going to be basically like a new signing, even though he's already been at the club for a year. So Tonali's back. Isak, fantastic season. Gordon blew my blew me away last season. But I just think Newcastle. They didn't strengthen. I don't know why they didn't strengthen more in this this summer. Yes, Bruno, Grumaish, yes, Tonali. The, the midfield is looking better. Kieran Trippier, Byrne, uh, Isak, Callum Wilson, Gordon. I understand Almiron. I understand the players they have, but I don't think Newcastle... You guys, the thing about league format, you need to, even if you feel like your squad is set, after a season, you there's always room for improvement. There's always room for new signings to get better. And I think compared to other teams I have above them, Newcastle haven't done that. And even without Europe this season, I don't think Newcastle will reach the expectations a lot of people a lot of people might have of them. So I think Newcastle ninth might be a little shocking, but for me, if this happens, I ain't surprised. I told you so. Newcastle ninth, eighth place. Now this, I think this is. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people I haven't re- gone and watched too many videos on YouTube to see where people are putting Crystal Palace. But for me, man, Crystal Palace, and you guys trust me, this is not because I'm going off of the last seven games of the previous season where they were scoring six goals a game. Olise, Eze, Jean Philippe Mateta, and, and all these guys were popping off. I understand. A lot of people are saying, don't fall for that hype. But I need you to understand that wasn't just hype. That is the culmination of Oliver Glasner's ideas taking full effect in this team. And we only saw six games of it where it was working in full force. Oliver Glasner is a fantastic manager. There's a reason why I wanted Oli Glasner to take over at Bayern when, after his time at Eintracht Frankfurt. It is because of this. He is able to mix attack and defense very well and give you an ex- exciting brand of football. And Crystal Palace, when is the last time Crystal Palace has been known for an exciting brand? Yes, they've been known for having Eze and back when Wilfred Zaha was here. They've been known to have an exciting attack, but overall football was never fantastic. With Oliver Glasner, the f- overall football is going to be great. It's going to be great. And, you know, I understand Crystal Palace, they did lose um, Olise to us at Bayern. I understand they did lose Olise, but I do like two signings they made. The first one is Marley Saar, right winger. He, ve- If you watch Oliver Glasner on track Frankfurt, he's kind of a similar style to Ansgar Ganauf, right winger, taking players on. So I like that signing from Ligue 1. But the big signing I like, the replacement for Olise that I think m- many people will not be looking out for is Daichi Kamara. Now, Daichi Kamara was the guy under Oliver Glasner in Eintracht Pfeiffer. Daichi Kamara was the heart and soul of that attack. Now, he went to Serie A. It wasn't too successful with him at Lazio. He's been brought in by Oliver Glasner for a reason because Oli Glasner knows how to get the best out of Daichi Kamara. I think in preseason so far, Daichi Kamara has been the best player for Crystal Palace. And I think for your fantasy Premier Leagues, for anybody looking out for exciting players this season, look out for the Japanese, the the, the Japanese international Kamara because under Oli Glasner, the guy is a different level. 
And I think he is going to fill the void of Elise pretty well. Now, different profile players, Kamara is more of a slower, creative player. He's not this dynamic, dynamic, fast guy that'll take on players like Olise was. But you already have guys like Eze in that team to do that. And you're going to have Kamara come in. And I really think he's going to create a lot of service for a guy like Jean-Philippe Matata to score some goals this season. So Crystal Palace, eight, eight, Crystal Palace, eight plays. They have a young midfielder in Adam Morton who I love. One of the, be the best up-and-coming CDMs in the world. In the back, Anderson. In the back, Munoz. Yehi. It's a good team, man. And Crystal Palace can do serious damage in the Premier League this season. So eighth place, I wouldn't be surprised. Seventh. Now, I think Aston Villa will have Newcastle Syndrome. As last year, you know, I call it Newcastle Syndrome. I, European football syndrome. I don't think Aston Villa... No, no, okay. Let me actually get this straight. Aston Villa strengthened, and I like the way they strengthened. They brought in Amadou Onana for the midfield. They brought in Ian Matson at left back. They brought in Cameron Archer as backup to Ollie Watkins. They brought in Ross Barkley. Now you're thinking, Ross Barkley, 2024, 2025. Are you crazy? Well, Ross Barkley was Luton's best player last season. He was fantastic. He really found himself at Luton in a team with lower expectations. Now he's making the jump up to a Champions League winning team. I mean, a Champions League quality team, a Champions League football team, and Aston Villa. So let's see what Ross Barkley does there. So the signings are great. They got rid of Douglas Suiz to Juventus. Diaby went off to Al Etifa, hack, fuck, 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 whatever. Zaniolo and Longley were lone players. But Amadou Anana, Ian Matza, Cameron Archer, and Ross Barkley, that's a strong, that's that's equally as good as West Ham's window, in my opinion. Equally as good. My issue is European football. Now, this is where I could be completely wrong and Aston Villa get fourth or third place. They have the team to do so. They have the team to challenge Chelsea, Tottenham, and Manchester United for the spots behind Liverpool, Arsenal, Man City, whatever. Whatever you have your ranking as. But Aston Villa, I think, with European football on the cards, let's see how their squad fares. I think that they won't achieve similar results in the league this season but i do think they could be a dangerous team in the champions league but aston villa i think they'll be worse off this season seventh place you know for aston villa standards though seventh place is great now will the aston, will aston villa fans expect more with the squad they have maybe so the defense is strong fantastic goalie in emmy martinez the midfield with onana there is looking great the attack potent but i just think with european football these this season i don't trust a club like aston villa to adjust on their first time in a while. It's been a first time since Aston Villa has been in Europe, I think. Um, so I think that this will cause them to get seventh place, three places worse than this past season where they got fourth. Um, sixth place, Chelsea. Now, initially, you guys, I wanted to put Chelsea like 10th. I, I really did. I wanted to put Chelsea down there, not just to be, you know, not just to be contrarian, not just to make a wild statement, rage bait. Not, no, no, not really, because... I really thought, first of all, their preseason has been horrible, right? But I really thought sacking Pochettino was the absolutely wrong move. You saw Pochettino and these players growing together towards the end of that season, putting up performances. I think Chelsea went on a pretty decent undefeated run from April, you know, end of March, April, and May. Chelsea was playing good football. They were getting results. They weren't losing. Pochettino was cracking the code with this team. But you sack him and you bring in Maresca. I think the main reason for Chelsea bringing in Maresca is because Maresca's style of football, what he was doing at Leicester, it's to impose more control in this Chelsea team. That's something this Chelsea team has lacked for a couple of years now. Even under Tuchel was control of the game. Grinding out results when you have a lead to not give it away because that was an issue with Chelsea last season. They would get leads, but they'd throw them away. They'd concede cheap goals. They'd lose the ball cheaply. With Maresca, the goal is to change that. It's to be more controlling of the ball in midfield. Really use the qualities of Enzo Fernandez and Moises Caicedo. To really use the qualities of Palmer and Kunku and all these guys. To control the ball and close out games with wins, which was something Chelsea struggled with. But I just think Maresca... Does he know how to get the best out of Cole Palmer? Does he know how to get the best out of a player like Christopher and Kunku? They just signed Pedro Neto. Does he know how to get the best out of these attacking players? I don't know. I I, I really don't know. And Victor Osiman might come into this team. You want to give Maresca that much attacking quality? I don't know if he'll be able to turn them into the machine that they're supposed to be in attack. I don't know. I think it was weird. Sixth place was a fantastic result for Chelsea last season. They were in mid-table for most of the year. But they trudged up to sixth. 
and all sixth and almost got Champions League football are in the conference league this season. So Maresca for me, I think they'll finish the same place. They got sixth last season. I think they'll get sixth this season. The team quality is there. And another thing that issues me with a with a team with a guy like Maresca trying to play this controlling style. Can you do that with such brick defenders like Badi Ashio? Disaster in the back. Reese's, Reese, Reese's pieces, Reese's James just got injured again. Can Mal, can Kukurea play the same as he did in the Euros for this Chelsea team? Let's see. Can Mal Augusto perform another good season deputizing for the Reese's pieces who's always injured? We'll see. But for Chelsea, I think sixth place again this season. Now, Manchester United. Now, Manchester United fifth. This is my, I think for me, this is my riskiest pick. This is absolutely my riskiest pick. Now, why do I say this is my riskiest pick? Now, let me start with the good with Manchester United. The good is that they have made fantastic signings, Manchester United. I love the signings. Lenny Yoro. Now, yes, Lenny Yoro got injured for three to four months, broke his foot, whatever. Joshua Xerxes, a player who is different profile to Rasmus Hoyland. He is a spilled up striker, assists and goals. He doesn't have to be a guy like Rasmus that just, you know, Give Rasmus service. If you don't give Rasmus service, he's useless. Xerxes is a different profile striker. Well, he wants to get involved in the attack, the build to play, drop in deep, and he will give you goals as well as assists. So that's a great signing, Xerxes, who had a fantastic season for Bologna under Thiago Mata last season. And for, this is where I take the L, guys. They're signing De Ligt. They're signing Masrawi from Bayern, double signing from Bayern. Such an L on Bayern's part. But for Man U, you are getting your defensive leader in De Ligt to start next to Lissandro Martinez. You're getting Luke Shaw, who's not injured anymore, who we know when Luke Shaw's fit, he plays well for Manchester United. And you're finally getting rid of dead weight like Aaron Juan Basaka and replacing him with, I think, one of the most well, third most well rounded right back in the world in Nusser Masrawi, only behind Kimmich and Danny Carvajal. Nusser Masrawi is going to make Manchester United fans cry with how good he is technically, how over well, overall well rounded he is in attack and defense. So, Manchester United, the defense looks good. The midfield, I would have liked to see them finalize a guy like Ugarte. So the midfield, is Casemiro going to start again? We know Casemiro so finished. So let's see. The attack is my issue for United. And this is where this could be, where my picket gets risky. Goals, goals, goals. I don't see goals in this attack. I don't see goals in this attack. Even with the inclusion of Xerxes, it's just that. Rasmus, unreliable. It's looking to be like he's injury prone. Marcus Rashford looked off the pace and horrible in the community she in the community shield just yesterday. So where are the goals going to come from? Garnacho every three games? That garbage player Anthony? I don't know. So this could be risky for me. I just think Eric Ten Hag with a solidified defense might be cooking something this season for Manchester United. And let's see if Xerxes gets more of a role in this team and could maybe spark that creativity that I think I think is missing right now for Manu. So Manchester United, fifth place. Now, Tottenham, fourth place. I, You know, Tottenham didn't look good in the two preseason games against Bayern. They didn't, but really, it's preseason. And just really trying to build this team to be comfortable playing out of the back. I think with Mickey van de Ven back. That's, you know, that's fantastic. They missed him all of last season. The pace he brings. Him and Kuti Romero back there. Put a Pedro Porro back there. Destiny Udogi. That's a good back line. In the midfield, solid. Now. This is where they attack. It gets good. Brendan Johnson, who had 10 assists in the Premier League last season for Spurs. He's going to be there. You have Kulusevsky, who has been one of the bright spots for Tottenham in preseason so far. You have Hyung Min Son. And the key thing, like I mentioned earlier in the video, Dominic Solanke is here. He's going to be the striker. And I think with Solanke there, you shift Son back to the left, who had a great season last year. Kulusevsky and Brendan Johnson on the right. You guys, that is an attack and Postukoglu is going to cook with this season. I think Tottenham will execute on the Champions League plans this year, and I think they will get fourth place. I think they're going a little bit under the radar. I don't know how many people are tipping them for fourth, but I really believe Ange, I like the brand of football he's playing. I fall in love with him as a manager. I didn't even know who he was a year and a half ago, and I think you know this year Ange is going to do something with this team and get them back into the Champions League. Third, Arsenal. So... Yes, you know, you know, I, I don't think this is too offensive. You get third, you're in the chain, you don't win the league. It, what's the difference between second and third? You both don't win the league. And I think Arsenal fans might be coming at my neck for putting you third behind, you know, Liverpool or Ma Liverpool and Manchester City. Surprise, surprise, they're my second and first. But I'm sorry. You guys, how many times in Premier League history has a team been able to go 
in back to back to back title races, three title races in a row without winning it. And they already were in two and they lost both. So I think Arsenal this season, yes. Now Arsenal, they did sign Calafiori, strength in the defense where I really didn't think they need to. They made David Raya official. They got rid of guys like Tavares on loan again. Lokonga went to Sofia. Emil Smith wrote a full So Deadweight is gone. Tierney is back from loan from Real Sociedad. And the Mikel Marino transfer is pending. But cool signings. You get Marino, awesome. Raya confirmed Calafiori. This is great, Arsenal. But again, you have not executed on what this team needs the most, and that is a clinical freaking striker. And I'm sorry. I love Kai Havertz. I love him. I'll always believe in him. But he is not the clinical striker you need. Now, who knows? Kai Havertz really grew into his own in this Arsenal team in the second half of the season. So who knows? If Arteta can get a full eight, seven, eight months out of this guy, who knows how many goals Kai Havertz can get? Can he hit the 20 plus mark? Who knows? We're going to have to see. But I just don't have that trust in Kai Havertz. I don't. And I think this team needs that guy to score the key goals like a Holland would for City. <clears throat> they need it. And they don't have it. They haven't made that signing. So Arsenal, I think this is going to be a slight drop-off season. I don't think they're going to be garbage. I think they're going to be a, 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 a respectable team in the Champions League, a respectable team in the Premier League. I just don't think they're better and have strengthened as much as Liverpool has. Now, Liverpool actually hasn't made too many signings themselves. I think the only big signing Liverpool has pending right now is Zubamendi from Real Sociedad. Now, they're trying to get that done, but that's you know the only notable signing they're trying to get done right now. Thiago retired last season. He's now Barcelona coach. The reason I put Liverpool second is because I love what I'm seeing from the side under Arnie Slot. Arnie Slot, Amber Rose, call him whatever you want. The Slot of whatever, Feyenoord, whatever you want to call him. He is implementing, a st he, his ideas are already translating in the Liverpool team. And I loved what I'm seeing. I loved what I'm seeing. Salah looks like he's understanding what Slot wants. Salah is looking like he's enjoying life. Gakpo, can he re replicate his form that he had for the Netherlands, for Liverpool? Can Luis Diaz, can he finally have a full breakout season where he's consistent the whole entire time? It's looking more likely than not. The issue, the issue now for Liverpool is one man and one man only and why they won't be true title challengers to we know who. Mr. Habibi Darwizi himself. El Habibi Darwizi Darbibi, he is the number one reason why Liverpool will be just off the pace off Man City and not be true title contenders because I do not trust this guy to put away the chances. Why? Because he has shown me for two seasons straight in the Premier League, he will miss 20 open goals a season. He will underperform his XG. He will miss chances you didn't think were possible of missing. So Darwin Wizzy, Darwizzy, Darbibi, Doc Martens, until you prove to me you can put the goals away for Liverpool, I understand you're a goal-scoring machine for Uruguay and you were for Benfica, but for two years now in the Premier League, they spent like 70, 80, 90 million euros on you. You have not shown it. You have missed chances I have not seen people miss before. You make Fernando Torres look like prime Gerd Muller, like prime Cristiano Ronaldo. So until that changes, Liverpool, second place. You won't touch the eventual champions this season. Manchester City, five in a row. As we all know, the Premier League is a farmer's league. This team, this league is dusted. Pep Guardiola has made a mockery of this league. He has used this league as practice and has made a fool of every manager, every pundit, every person in England. Five in a row for Man City. Erling Haaland, I think, is going to have a better season than he did last. You know what's crazy? You know what's sick about Man City last season? Erling Haaland had a poor season. Well, still the top goal scorer in the league. 27 goals. And he underperformed his XG compared to the season previous where he won the Premier League goal scoring record. Got the Premier League goal scoring record. And last season, he had more XG than he did first season. So I'm expecting even more XG this season as Pep Guardiola continues to find new ways to feed this kid chances. Do I do? I, I'm fully expecting an Erling Haaland 30 plus goal season this season, 27 goals in the Premier League. And he's considered a bad season 30 plus this season. Kevin, De Bruyne is an injured coming into the season. He's going to be there from the jump. Rodri, everyone, you know, and these guys didn't even have to make that many signings, dude. Savino, I think is the only guy they signed. They got rid of Jan Kutu, sold him to Dortmund. 
you guys, Man City will be your 24-25 Premier League champions. Five in a row, making a mockery of the league, breaking every single record. And it's just, it is it is what it is. You cannot stop the inevitable. Pep is Thanos. Pep is Thanos. And until he leaves this league, he will continue to win it every season. He will continue to laugh in your face as he lifts another Premier League trophy. Man City, your 2024-2025 Premier League champions. This has been Okage Puya. I hope you enjoyed the video. 40 minutes of peak Hokage yapping. I'll see you guys in the next one.